Hello, my name is Eric Martin. I'm with the Mechanical Engineering Department at the University of Maine, and we are going to look at a statics review intended for students in strength and materials and machine design courses. The outline for this review is shown here. Um, we will first uh, remind ourselves of resultant versus reaction forces, then do a review on free body diagrams, quickly look at equations of equilibrium, and then do a couple sample problems. And the first thing we're going to examine are two categories of forces that are often confused between one another. The first is resultants and the second are reactions. Resultants are the sum of two or more vectors and the vectors must be similar to one another when we add them. So the force vectors must be added to force vectors, moment vectors added to moment vectors. Sometimes we call our moment vectors couples or couple moments or moment couples. Uh, they all mean the same thing. The second category of forces are reactions and these are constraining forces located at a support and they prevent either a linear motion or rotation. In two dimensions, there are three possible motions, and we call these degrees of freedom. Uh, linear directions are x and y, and then rotation about the z-axis. And then in three dimensions, we have six degrees of freedom, which result in or mean six possible motions. And these are linear motions in the x, y, and z directions, as well as rotation about the x, y, and z axes. When we are creating our free body diagrams, we must include a reaction for every motion that is prevented by the support. So resultant forces are just the sum of two or more vectors. In this case, we have two forces, F1 and F2, acting on a hook. And so if we were to add those two vectors, and I'm just going to do this symbolically, we have F1 plus F2 is equal to our resultant force. We can see that we have a force resultant acting in this direction and we can use trigonometry to determine what the actual magnitude and the direction is of the resultant force but that's basically all the resultant is so now let's look at the reactions at the support which is the interface between the hook and the shaded surface we're going to call this interface we're going to call that point o and before we actually draw our reactions, we also want to um, just maybe fully or better indicate which our positive direction uh, that we'll be using to sum our moments. And that's about the z-axis. The z-axis is, of course, coming out of the board uh, or out of the screen towards you, the student. It uses the right-hand rule. And so we want to include our reactions. Well, since this is a 2D problem, we have three possible motions that are limited by their by the support. And since this is a fixed support, that uh, fastener, that hook can't move, we have uh, three, three motions that are restricted. Uh, the restricted motions is it can't move in the x direction. So we're going to call this reaction Rx. It also can't move in the y direction. So we call that RY. And then it also can't rotate about the z-axis or about an axis parallel to the z-axis. And so we're going to call that MO, a moment about point O. Now you may notice that I've directed all my reactions in the same direction as my positive coordinate system. That's not a rule, but that seems to be helpful when it comes to summing forces during the equations of equilibrium. Um, one thing that you might notice uh, when you're doing problems such as this is that the resultants of F1 and F2 are going to end up being the same as the resultants of Rx and Ry. Um, and then this is typically true, uh, but it's not true for our couples such as MO, nor is it true when we have um, cases involving internal forces. So here we have a 3D problem with a green pipe. We have a pin or a hinge located at point A. Um, and at point B, a cable that um, is directed between B and C is also supporting the green pipe. At point A, we have the hinge. And again, for any support in three dimensions, we have six possible motions that are restricted. 
the motions at the pin that can move are rotation about the Y as well as a, a linear motion about the in the Y direction. Everything else is restricted. So we have a restricted motion in the X direction. We'll call this AX. We have a restricted linear motion in the Z direction. We'll call that AZ. Once again, in the Y direction, we don't have motion restricted. It's uh, potential that it's free to move in that direction. Um, and then we can look at our rotation in the X, Y, and Z axis. And so we can see that the two bearings or the two pillow blocks are preventing rotation about the X axis. And we can call this MX. Notice I make a double arrow for my moments. Uh, it's a little bit easier to do than these type right here. Um, and in the Z direction, we also have a rotation that's restricted and we'll call this MZ. Again, we don't have any motion or any rotation restricted in the Y direction, and that's because it is a hinge or a bearing. So let's take a look at point B. At point B, we have the cable that runs between C and B. And in this case, we have linear motion that's prevented in the X, Y, and Z directions. Now, I understand that the cable um, could be compressed, um, which would allow motion, but we would assume that the cable is always in tension, and since it's always in tension, then we have motion that's been restricted. Again, we're talking about static equilibrium, and so there is no motion uh, or no acceleration. So in this case, we have motion restricted in the X direction. Let's call this BX motion restricted in the Y direction, we can call that BY, and then motion restricted in the Z direction, we can call that BZ. The sum of these three forces, BX, BY, and BZ, would be the resultant force, we can call it RB if we'd like. Sometimes we have a situation where a support appears to restrict rotation, but if the member is supported elsewhere, the reaction moment at that support is small and it should be neglected. We typically know this if the total number of unknowns exceed the equations of equilibrium. It is possible that a support is overconstrained. Hinges, pins, and uh, different bearings such as journal and thrust bearings are typical culprits. If we were to take a look at this member AB, we see that we have a pin connection or pin support at B, and at A we have a collar. Now if we were to look at the collar alone, kind of at the so-called small scale, we see that we would have motion that's allowed in the A direction, but we would not have motion in the X direction or the horizontal direction, and we would not have motion vertically, I'm sorry, uh, rotationally about point A. So if we were to include our reactions, we'll start at B. At B we have a vertical reaction because motion can't uh, move in the vertical direction, so we have BY. The same goes in the X direction, BX. We do have uh, rotation that's uh, able to happen about B, so there is no moment reaction at B. At A, we have a horizontal reaction, AX, and it would seem that we would also have a moment reaction, we'll call it MA. So what we see is that we have four unknown reactions, AX, MA, BX, and BY, but we only have three equations of equilibrium. And so what that means is that our member is overconstrained, and what happens is this moment at A is actually uh, small compared to the rest of the forces and so we can actually neglect that moment and we then have three unknowns AX, BX, and BY and three equations of equilibrium and so we're able to solve this without any problem. The next topic we're going to look at is free body diagrams 
and these are necessary to properly determine forces and moments um, acting on a body or a member. If we were to consider the street light in the picture, a free body diagram or even multiple free body diagrams would be necessary to determine what type of supports you have at the base, maybe what kind of support you have at the junction between the two poles, what your supports are at the light fixtures, um, the sizing of your pole. Again, so a free body diagram can be used to determine all the forces within your pole um, in this case. To properly construct a free body diagram, we first need to draw our body free from its surroundings. In this case, we'll have our light fixture um, and only our light fixture. We won't have the supports at the bottom. We won't have the lights on them. We're just going to have the simplified poles. And we're also going to need to include forces acting on the body. In this case, we have forces from our lights as well as, and those would be our active forces, as well as our internal forces will have gravity. And then we'll have our reactions. And that's um, basically the reaction with uh, ground in this case. And we'll have to fully describe these force vectors with magnitude, direction, and location. If we don't know um, any of these, we can assume uh, direction as well as just put variables for um, spacing um, as well as magnitude. And then finally, we need to establish a coordinate system. It should be noted that uh, the first step must be drawing the free body uh, free of its surroundings, but steps three, uh, two, three, and four um, are insignificant as the order. So let's draw our free body diagram. The first thing we're going to do is to draw our body free of its surroundings. And the idea here is to be clear and concise. And so that is our light fixture. The next thing we're going to do is include our active forces and we have a light here. We don't know the weight of it. So we're just going to include light one. Then we can include our second light. We'll call that light two. And those are our two only active forces. The next will be our internal forces, which is gravity. And so we will separate our pole into two components. And we'll have um, our center of gravity here. And we're going to call this weight one. And then we'll have another center of gravity halfway up. With, along with its weight, we'll call that weight two. And so that is our internal forces. And then finally, we have our reactions, which we have a vertical reaction. We're going to call this, uh, we'll call this point O, and so we can call this O Y O X and then we also have a moment about O and we can call this M O here at the bottom and so that is our reaction it's a fixed support so we have three reactions in step number three, we need to fully describe each vector with a magnitude. Well, again, we don't know what the magnitudes are, or maybe we do know them uh, from a uh, spec sheet or from our previous design, uh, but we've just included them as uh, variable names. And so we also uh, included our direction, uh, which everything was pointing down due to gravity in this case. Um, and then we need to include the locations. And again, we don't know them right off, but we'll just give variable names. We'll call D1, which will be the distance between um, our support and light fixture one. And we'll have this to be D2 to light fixture two. And then D3 can be to the center gravity of the upper, uh, upper column, D3. And then the height to the center of gravity, we can call that D4. And then our overall height, D5. 
and that includes all our distances. Uh, finally, we want to include um, our coordinate system, and we're going to use a typical XY system. And it's helpful to include the direction of uh, positive rotation uh, with a right-hand rule coordinate system. It's counterclockwise, and so that's what we show here. Our last topic is the equations of equilibrium, and this typically is the easiest to understand. And that basically says that um, our resultant force and our resultant couple moments of the entire system is equal to zero. In planar systems or two dimensions, we typically use uh, the sum of the force in the x direction is equal to zero, the sum of the force in the y direction is equal to zero, and the sum of the moment about uh, the z axis or a axis parallel to z is equal to zero. In spatial or 3D systems, we just um, include um, the force in the z direction is also equal to zero, and the sum of the moments in the y and the x directions are also equal to zero.